Uh, you know, I think I think it's at its root, uh, Monocyte is a story about the horrors of immortality. Like if you walked up to most common people on the street and you asked them, you know, hey, I can grant you immortality, most people would, would be like, yeah, I'll, I'll be immortal, that sounds awesome. But you know, what, what would happen in a world if technology made that possible, where, you know, no one died? And imagine, you know, George Bush is in power forever, and there's really nothing you can do about it. And, you know, this, this story takes place after that's happened for a very long time. And, um, you know, fundamentally and quickly, uh, if I'm going to sum up the book, the, the Monocyte asks the questions, how would you have it be, and uh, in relation to, to the horrors of the world that we create for us. Yeah. It's supposed to be an action adventure. And the, 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 I don't know who coined it, but somebody's calling it an occult action adventure, which is very much what it is. I mean, I have a, a long, um, I guess you could say, occult background, where most of my life I've studied, you know, pretty much every type of religion or, or cult belief and practice some of them and try to watch this crazy stuff out. And, and Kazar has a, a, a background in, um, in biotech. And so there's two races in the book. One is immortal through alchemy and through um, magic, more or less. And the other race is immortal through technology. So we really kind of brought um, our, our, our knowledge base of, of those two things and really tried to come up with like a reasonable, um, understandable and, and way for these people to actually be immortal. I mean, not that that's possible in our, our day and time, but we came as close as we possibly could, technically. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you've got action adventure and then you've got like kind of this sci-fi occult thing, but there are some political and, and social overtones to it, but we're not preaching to anybody and we're not shoving it in anybody's face. We're just, it's there if you want to see it. One of the things about growing up in the 70s and 80s is that you had to keep going to comic book shops and uh, talking to people and looking what came out every month and looking for the guys that you loved. And we were both drawn to the art and Bill Sienkiewicz when he exploded onto the scene uh, with, with uh, Moon Knight and New Mutants just completely blew our minds and blew my mind. And I actually would go to the comic book shop and I loved comic books because Bill Sienkiewicz basically compelled me to keep going back to the shop and look for what he was going to come out with next. Uh, on the other side of the, this, uh, of like the experimental weird stuff that was coming out then was uh, uh, Bob Layton and John uh, Remita Jr.'s and Dave Michelini's run on Iron Man. The uh, uh, issues, let's say 126 to 140, 150, ending with uh, Doctor Doom were like kind of the height of my uh, Marvel Zombie uh, upbringing. And then past that, it's been really the painterly guys that came up in the mid 80s out of New York, which was George Pratt, uh, Kent Williams, uh, John Muth, and even to some extent uh, earlier and through that time, Jeffrey Jones, Jeffrey Catherine Jones, uh, they completely set the bar for American comics uh, at, at a level I, th I don't think that had been seen before, like books like Moonshadow and Havoc and Wolverine and Blood from Kent Williamson, eventually Wolverine Natsuki from George Pratt, and then my arc for the love of comic books, I mean, it doesn't end and begin with what I'm saying now, but it, it's someone like Ted McKeever who's a writer-artist who's different than anybody else who really sees the world in, in, in a totally individualistic way, an intact way, and, and, and is able to convey that and articulate that in, in his works. He's like a comic book auteur. And those are the guys that I've gravitated towards. Yeah, Bill Sienkiewicz for me uh, was a huge influence as a child. And, uh, you know, I, Straight Toaster's issue too is when I, I looked at a book and I went, I, I want to make comics. You know, it blew my mind. Um, and then, you know, uh, you know, I kind of had a resurgence into comics with uh, Ashley Wood and uh, Ben Temple Smith. There's something weird about this city and the fact that I don't think, I, I work a lot. I mean, I've been doing a lot of work and I don't think I would do nearly as much work in any other city. There's something about the fact that, I don't know what it is, I can't articulate it, but the winter has something to do with it, the seasons, but there's also just a mood in the city. It's a very, it's very conducive to working, and, and it's very easy to get inspired here to work. Um, you know, it's not the museum, it's, it's not even really the people or the architecture. There's just something about the city that I think. You're not as distracted. You have more of a, of, a, of a center. There's a lot more collaboration here. I mean, the guys and the girls and whoever's involved in the comic book industry here, they actually get together and generalistically like one another and talk to one another, whether it be online or in person or drink and draw or at an event. And we have awesome comic book shops here. Yeah, like, I, I I actually don't know why the comic book shops are so good. I think. So.
Well, whenever I get like I'm having a hard day and I'm like, like I don't know what I'm gonna do for a cover, or I'll go to Ash's blog and within like three minutes I'm like, oh, I got an idea. Like, he's so inspiring because I don't know. I, a lot of stuff he paints is he, he doesn't say fast. Yeah. I don't know that I want to do that, I and mean, I don't want to be that. I think it's very much his personality up. though. Yeah, because he's very quick to make decisions and just off the cuff, and his his art sort of is like that. But it's very structured. I know you know what goes into it. But at the same time, it looks like it's so like, bam, bam, bam. There is something about the two of you guys, though. There is something distinctly Australian about, like, there's, because there's a humor in, the, in both of your art. Oh, we have a sense of humor. Yeah. The difference. Because, like, the whole Jim Lee, Michael Turner, American thing. You guys, you guys are very honest. Really? You would say Australian? Literal. Literal. Australian. 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 We're liars. We are liars. Because your whole country was founded on criminals. We excel at like gallows humor. We, we like seeing the funny side of shit. And the shit. Well, we have plans. And plans and plans. I mean, it, when, when me and Kazra uh, sat down to finally write this, we didn't just write this story. We wrote hundreds of years before it and hundreds of years after the occurrence. And, and are you George and Lucas now? Well, I mean, I'm glad you said no. Um, <laughs> well, isn't the movie going to be directed by Guillermo del Toro? Yes. No. no. Uh, there's, there's, no, there's no movie yet. No, uh, Let's get that out there, but it'll start. Well, <laughs> you know, we, we, we are talking to Circle of Confusion a little bit. We, we had a meeting in San Diego about the book, and, you know, all things look good with that. But, um, you know, this wasn't written to be a miniseries, necessarily. A lot of what was written for this was kind of to be an ongoing series. So this is just the first four books in like an extremely long story. I mean, it, you're gonna get a full story from beginning to end, absolutely, but there's a lot more that takes place, there's a lot more that happens, because when we wrote it, we didn't write it from that perspective, we wrote an entire thing, and went, okay, what point is the best entry point? What's the most exciting point to start this off from? And we took that place and wrote the first, uh, it's called in, in the Land of the Blind and One-Eyed King. It's like the first edition of a, a whole thing that hopefully will be coming. We pick